Devoni. I'm Claire Steele from California State University Channel Islands, and I have the honor today of introducing the WSN Naturalist of the Year. So I'd like to welcome you all to coastal Southern California. I hope you've had a chance to go outside and enjoy the view. Um, just off our shoreline, we have the amazing California Channel Islands. Some of the folks in our region have familial ties to this island that link to some of the earliest human inhabitants of North America. And those of us that have had the privilege to visit these islands know what unique and special places those islands are and how they can enact profound and transformative experiences for visitors, researchers, and students alike. Our Naturalist of the Year has had a profound and lifelong dedication to promoting understanding and stewardship of these treasures in the sea. They have dedicated their entire career to observing and understanding the marine life of the northern Channel Islands that make up the Channel Islands National Park. He received his bachelor's degree in aquatic biology from UC Santa Barbara in 1989 and joined the Channel Islands National Park in 1990. His career spans more than three decades of service in the National Park Service, and he has led the Kelp Forest Monitoring Program, the longest established inventory and monitoring program in the National Park Service for most of that career. In four decades, four decades, since the Kelp Forest Monitoring Program was established in 1982, it has maintained an impressive collection and a breadth of data on kelp forest ecology over a long time series. As many of you know, it's extremely challenging to maintain funding and support for long-term monitoring programs. He has fiercely defended the importance of the program and the data that it collects, which has contributed significantly to our understanding of large-scale ecological patterns in kelp forest communities. In his leadership of the kelp forest monitoring program, He's provided significant insights into the impact of invertebrate fisheries and the effect of oceanographic anom anomalies that would not have been possible without a naturalist's expert skills in observation. He's had a storied career as a diver since the age of 16. He spent more than 1,500 days, that equates to more than four years at sea, and in his more than 4,500 dives around the California Channel Islands has trained generations, more than 300 individuals, and introduced, oh, sorry, generations of divers, and introduced them to the unique wonders of the Channel Islands National Park. So please welcome National Park Service Marine Biologist and WSN's Naturalist of the Year, David Krishnan. Friends. 
that are confidants, naturalists, mentors, students, and who understood the nature of the recognition to be part of WSM or other similar organizations. I also share this information with my family members. What to do with it? Nothing but a warm and great response from them, but yet very different from the type of appreciation from my biologist and naturalist friends. I guess this was to be expected. With more thought about this, a few days later, I sent an email to my family asking them to share with me what the word naturalist meant to them. I will share some of these answers shortly, as they point out some of my successes and perhaps failures in areas I need to improve on with my family and others. My hopes in sharing these may be cause for humor, but also realization that perhaps it's not only I that needs to be spend more time and effort in explaining natural history to people we are close to and others. So I'll back to share so far. This is good. Okay. Um, so then, then I started thinking what it is to have this natural sphere designation. I'm not really like to call it an award, but thank you very much. Do I deserve this? Or is it really an award to WSN and all naturalists, or perhaps all my mentors? After all, the definition of a naturalist is an expert in or student of natural history. I would like to change that definition. It's really both. Anyone with an interest in natural history is a naturalist and does both expert or student deserve the award, or rather both. Again, it's mutually inclusive. I might also add that I'm not so sure I can consider myself, or perhaps any of my naturalist mentors, experts, as all of them, including me, are continuing to be students of the natural history of the world, the planet, and elsewhere. I certainly love and enjoy being a student and mentor in natural history. It is simply one, if not the most rewarding aspects of my life. While this word is not a competition, we certainly can challenge ourselves when it comes to being a naturalist, both as mentor and student. I believe all of us are expert and object historians in our offices, our homes, our vehicles, whatever we use, whatever we're around. And any new object that might appear in your house, you can either pick up or look at and probably tell where the origin is, um, or at least where it was manufactured. However, when we go out to the natural world, while we may know many of the natural things we observed, how do you think we can easily become overwhelmed and perhaps complacent and not learn something new? So I've observed this with staff for the last 30 years in monitoring. They'll learn the indicator species that we monitor, they do a great job at that, but they'll stop there. So this past field season, I've also noticed over the years too that I've seen people in general pick up books and learn things on their own or ask questions. There's fewer questions than we've seen in the past. So I actually asked my staff to, on the next survey guide, to go find three species they didn't know and identify them either by asking me or a human book. This was an extremely appreciated and rewarding experience. So I've challenged myself with this own task too, because I too have become complacent. And I'll give you some examples of that. Um, and after thinking about this talk and what I wanted to say, I conclude that we all must have our own natural history. Otherwise, we wouldn't be at this meeting. And we all deserve the award, perhaps rather recognition, since we are all experts, students, to each other and ourselves. Okay, so now for the fun part. Poop. <laughs> well, hot for poop. In fact, I got a call yesterday, or an email yesterday, um, out of, you know, sort of out of the blue, along sessions with Bob Miller, wanting the lobster poop in the freezer that I've had at the office for the last five years. That's a different discussion. So, I show up at my dad's house a few weeks ago, or a month ago, and, um, well, he shows me this poop and wants to know what it's from. And so I go around the house, and there's a poop, there's another pile of poop, and I look at it, and I think, okay, it's a fox or a skunk, and I start tearing it apart, there's some arthropod skeletons in there, and I really don't know what it is. So what do I do? I put it in the trunk. I figure I'll, bad enough, put it in the trunk, I figure I'll ask my naturalist friends about it, they know more about terrestrial mammals than I do. And, um, how'd you go? Actually, Claire, can you let me know when it's like, um, maybe, well, we only have 15 minutes left. So I'm giving you several talks here. So, uh, so anyways, so uh, my staff, we show up for the boat. This is a couple, a couple weeks ago, and one of my staff forgot the water bottle. So she says, you have an extra water bottle. I say, yes, here, go to the car, look in the trunk. Well, in the trunk she finds a water bottle and also this bag of poop. She, she comes back 
asking me. So I found the water bottle. Why do you have a bag of shit in your car? <laughs> so I'm thinking nothing of this. I mean, doesn't everybody? So I actually told her, I said, it's to keep the thieves away. <laughs> Maybe a good idea. So anyway, so mentors, there's way too many to list here. I started looking at the naturalists of the year. And 12 of the 26 I've had personal interactions with. I wish I remember from every single one of them. I could sit here the rest of the talk and just tell you about the mentors and the excitement, okay? So much excitement from these people. Kathy Ann Miller at the top. I mean, I've only had a few interactions with her. I call her and ask her questions, but her excitement just exudes. It, it's unbelievable the impact she's had as mentors. And so those things have rubbed off. In this lower left corner here, um, Bruce Rankin and Carolyn Green, who became a volunteer at Channel Islands when she retired. Those were my first mentors when I was a kid. They were taking me on outdoor education family backpack or camping trips when I was five. They taught me about natural history. They taught me to appreciate it. And in high school, I worked for them for an outdoor education department teaching and, and mentoring day camps. So natural history has been embedded in my life from day one. But those people I'm still in touch with. Those are my mentors of life. Um, Paul Dayton. In the center here, Armin Curis. Armin Curis taught me. You know who's Armin here? Um, I'm going to grab my water here. Um, Armin Curis, a parasitologist at UC Santa Barbara. He taught me, one of the first things he told me when I showed up as an undergraduate, I started getting involved in his lab. He said, everybody gets a PhD until proven otherwise. Now, I don't want to be the method literally the people that are going out for a doctor degree. It's a huge challenge. But the message there is we're all as intelligent, we all have that capacity um, or that brain power to be a PhD um, until proven otherwise. And I've gone through life thinking of that of all the people I talk to, all my, all my staff, um, all the volunteer doctors and whatnot. So then he also opened, opened me up to the world of parasitology, which I was a little bit interested in. And I'll challenge you all of you here, if you're not interested in parasitology, you're missing half of the organisms on the planet. Because almost everything has a host-specific parasite. Okay, and then Tom Dudley in the lower right corner actually started off doing freshwater biology because I was interested in backpacking and screening some of these areas. Okay, so a little bit of going back to the childhood. So, 1972, my seventh grade report, I value my frogs because I raised them from tadpoles. Okay, not something I thought about. Well, 50 years later, COVID, somebody gives me some tadpoles. I now have frogs in my kitchen. Okay. Early 1970s, with my sister looking at the tide pools. Here I am working through the park in the 1990s and the tide pools. Okay, these are things I never thought as a child, but these are some of the things that we can do as mentors with the people in our lives, the young people, the old people. It doesn't really matter what race, what age, it doesn't matter, but getting people interested and involved. Early 1970s, 2005, I still love the fish. The fish are a lot smaller today. <laughs> but, um, one of, my, one of my friends, or a past co-worker who calls our sensory picture, he just caught some bark surf perch. The first thing I asked him was, that how did they taste? And I said, well, what was in the gut? <laughs> so, of course, he didn't look. I was very disappointed. <laughs> okay. So I'm talking a little more, and we're starting to talk about the internal rewards and the rewards of being a naturalist um, and mentoring. So white abalone. White abalone are oh, this, the first listed marine invertebrate on the endangered species list. Um, Buzz Owen on the right, and Miriam, and this is his wife. Buzz is a shell collector, and I did an oral history of him in 2000. Because he was one of the few people that had some insight into, did anybody ever see juvenile white abalone? What we discovered from the oral histories is there's been probably widespread recruitment failure for decades. Most of the abalone he encountered were large, so he's just not very easy. Okay? And he taught me a lot of other fallacies. They're not a deep water species. There were harps that in shallow that reported this pink abalone in the shallow water species because there's no difference on the ticket. Even though in the literature, people think that it's a deep water species. Fallacy. So I've taken that information buzz and I've been promoting and teaching people what abalone even yesterday. So this is from a dive yesterday I did with the Citizen Science Group and partners at the um, Aquarium of the Pacific and, and NOAA and UCSB Dive Club. I think there's a few people here that were on that trip yesterday. Um, and I asked this group of people who were diving, spending their own time, to go look for white abalone in these areas where we think we might see them. Um, we saw a live one for the first time in 15 years 
um, in, in near, near an area where we drove yesterday at the Channel Islands. And I asked her, raise her hands, how many people have seen a live white alligator before? It's only about 25% of them. So here we are today as naturalists looking for things that we've never seen before. And they're not easy to identify. I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Constantly learning. I finally made it to the Smithsonian Natural History Museum this year. I was so excited. The Hall of Deep Time. I walked around it for hours and hours. I went back three days in a row. <laughs> Just because of the context. It was pretty amazing. Um, the desert. So instead of working on this talk that I've actually never had anxiety about a talk I've had for this one, I went to the desert last week because I had a two-week trip and I had to cancel the week of it. And, um, well, I've got some foot issues and some back issues, and so I spent a little bit more time sitting. But this upper left-hand photo, those little black specks, again, poop. Okay. Um, I noticed them on the other side of this mountain range, and um, there was not much vegetation. I get to the other side of the mountain range, and there's all this vegetation. It's quite obvious there was a ton of rain just a few months ago. This is a mountain range I've been going back to since 1990. Um, one of my mistakes in life is not doing a photo series uh, or doing some monitoring out the desert because I've seen some pretty dramatic changes. And I realized that, oh my gosh, there are no butterflies on this one side, or no caterpillars on the one side of the range at the same elevation as the other side. And the vegetation was probably very similar, but you can see that denuded plant in that photo. And I didn't realize it until I was able to see the perspective and compare things. So think about that when you think about natural history. It's all about the time and perspective and the perspective of scale. And I'll talk more about that when I show you some of the Gulf Force monitoring data. The reason why I think I have more than 15 minutes on this talk is Crow told me you're going to have 15 minutes to talk. And I said, I can't talk about 42 years of monitoring in 15 minutes. This is not possible. So anyways, the other thing I did, which I've never done before, so again, I had some foot problems and I couldn't walk around, is I saw, we saw more tarantulas, my friend and I, than I've ever seen in my entire life out in the desert, this one, one last week. And the males roam around in September and October, they look for a mate. And I thought I really couldn't do anything, I couldn't walk, so I, for three hours, I watched this tarantula. Um, and at the end of the three hours, I literally was sunburned, I had to get out of the sun, I couldn't do it anymore. I was like moving the chair around watching the tarantula move around and it would like hide in bushes. And a couple days later I was thinking about that behavior and I'm thinking, oh my gosh, maybe I was totally my knees. The tarantula was hiding in the bushes because it knew I was there. And it wasn't me actually observing the behavior. So I'll have to try this all over again. So we'll try okay. And then there's things we saw this last summer. I don't know what they are. I'm showing you pictures here because maybe you can answer. This is it's a little urchin spine in the right corner. This is about an inch long. It looks like some sort of team four, and it's got these tentacles that will move it along on the bottom. And this came up from your recruitment module. If you know what this is, you can tell me later. I appreciate it. Then there's the fish that we got at night. This fish would play dead in the light and pick it up with a net. And of course, you know, I, I come back and we sell like five pictures of Milton Love. And he's like, I don't know what it is. Did you collect the sample? I said, no, I didn't collect the sample. I wanted to, but my staff got mad at me for killing it. So we put it back in the ocean. The answer to that is collect the sample. Okay. <laughs> Something I don't really do. All right, and then teaching. Not just teaching others, but teaching teachers. So teaching interpreters at the park has been so rewarding because they then spread that information probably way better than I can because I'm a scientist and I don't speak normal language. I don't think normally. That's become very apparent in my life and you'll see that a bit with my parents. Okay, and then who shows up to parties and tries to teach your, your guests how to identify Adelaide? I think. So, um, and I do it via a test, and that works really well for some people and not others. Um, you know, here's the sheet, go try and identify the abalone, and what you get wrong, I'll try and explain why. Um, that's my tactic. It works well sometimes, it doesn't work well other times. It's working less well today than it did 20 years ago, for reasons that will be a really fun discussion. Identification of invasive species. This is Andaria on the left, and on the right is a comparison with Andaria and Macrocystis. We need to teach each other how to identify these things. It's not easy. So I can't tell you how many staff come on the program and they're intimidated by algae because they've never done it before. And you start to show it once, twice. By the third time, they usually get it. They're, they're experts at it. They can teach somebody else. But there are nuances that I can't explain to you unless I have these things in hand. Really difficult. Same with that one. Then there's documenting and sharing these things. So Melissa Douglas at, at PCO at UC Santa Cruz and I collectively put together a key 
to get everybody on the same page that was seeing diseases and, or, or potential diseases in Earth, if we don't know what the causes of the elements. And there's black spot and there's wasting disease, and this is a descriptive um, 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 product that we get people to be able to call the same things that are uh, the same. And then there's perhaps the passive teaching. This is the more fun. This is sitting around the dinner table and telling people what to eat. This is definitely the most humorous one. And so these are some scallops in the upper upper left-hand photo that I served a couple more staff this year and trying to get a few scallops and then just eat some of the animals that we count. And I never did this on the site. You know, my thought was the one that killed, but that's what we have to kill. But no. And in those scallops this year were the third is the pea crab. And these are a soft shell crab and they're inside the shell in a really amazing life cycle. They actually have parasite that be on the tissue. And they're all get all grabbing because all you're seeing is the females. The males aren't in there, they the males are outside and they, they, they spawn and they're gonna leave them and come back and spawn, which I don't really understand. And I served up the pea crabs, the grab pea crabs, cooked in butter. And it turns out everybody liked the pea crabs more than the scallops. <laughs> a few people were kind of grossed out by it, but they're delicious. Anyway, <laughs> and then there's gotta eat the right crabs and they when they're coming through. And then there's answering phone calls. Okay, these are often from family members, they're often from other researchers, or from people out of the blue, or sometimes from the public. And it's very rewarding to answer people's questions, but it also brings me to question things and I don't know the answers, and it's a challenge. So again, it's mentoring and being a student all at the same time. Okay, family tasks. So without looking up, this is like I sent this out to all my immediate family members and a few of their the non-immediate family, so like my cousins, husbands, or wives. Without looking up the word naturalist, please send me your simple definition of what comes to mind when you hear the word naturalist. This sort of made me feel, and I saw the answers, and you're not going to see all of them, you're going to see most of them. Made me feel like maybe I live on a different planet. <laughs> okay, so, family tasks. So, things happen naturally, and naturalists accept things. <laughs> Someone who lives mostly off the land while keeping their impacts to a minimum. Someone who likes things who are not, I like the who part, who are not man-made, <laughs> such as plants. They like natural things that come from nature. <laughs> a smelly and truly very granola fat nudist, hypocrite, who lives in a shack but comes from a wealthy family to support lifestyle. This is a whole discussion in itself. <laughs> and that shows to me would be some person who likes to be alone in nature, as well as sharing knowledge of the animal kingdom and the wonderful, natural, beautiful wonder around us. In addition, usually an uninhibited person who will rock so much shower and can do when appropriate and would not offend anyone. So this is from the non-immediate family. A naturalist is one who studies nature. A person that studies and has a breadth of knowledge about the ecosystems of either a specific geographic location or the earth as a whole and future preserves and protects the ecosystem. A person that loves and is driven to study ecosystems including past, present, and future and that person analyzes and documents the findings for current and future generations. What this told me here was that not the immediate family are listening to me. <laughs> the family have tuned me up for probably decades, and they don't get what I do. So this is a challenge for me. This is not something I'm really willing to accept. A few more answers than that was. Someone who is one, one with the earth and cares through its actions and lifestyle. Someone who's not afraid to let it all hang and bear all. There's a theme going on here. A naturalist is someone who enjoys and studies nature and the new. I don't know what my family think is, but they're totally naive. The ocean's cold. We're not out there in the new. <laughs> so anyway, all right. So um, you should all write this down. This is an American Scientist publication that came out in 2017. If you just look up why ecology needs natural history, I would highly recommend this paper if you haven't read it. And really what this is showing as a group in academia, we're going more and more towards applied science, which is important. I'm not belittling that. And moving further and further away from natural history, which is ever important, especially as we lose species, we lose the potential to have observations as our environment changes, and I can go on and on and on and on. And this is just showing the decline in courses and decline in pieces. So again, I highly recommend this paper. It's a very good read, Why Ecology Needs Natural History. Um, it explains the importance of long-term monitoring. 
which I'm going to switch over and talk about that now. So I think, Sarah, how many? I have, I have another hour, is that right? <laughs> 50 minutes? Okay, perfect. So I'm going to go pretty quick here. So being, I was trying to figure out, okay, what do I talk about? Do I talk about being a naturalist? I think you all get the picture. And it's a challenge to all of us to be better naturalists. Better, better students. Um, but I want to just talk about the honoring program, which is what I love to talk about. It's been my passion for 32 years. Collecting data has been a selfless act. It's not collected for me, it's collected for you. Um, it's collected for the public, it's collected for researchers. If we have the data that we started collecting in 1982 back to 1990 or 1850, I guarantee you today we'd be managing our resources completely different. Okay, and I mentioned this little note on the bottom here that 50% of the park was underwater, and only 20% of that is protected. The rest of it looks like a war zone. It's an ecological disaster for my eyes. And we need to better protect our oceans and our terrestrial environments, but we need the time scale perspective, and we need everybody to really have that perspective and understand it, which is difficult. My perspective has changed dramatically over time, and I'll try and talk a little bit about it in the future. So the Channel Highlands, if you don't know where this is, look on the map. Okay, uh, I'm going to go through these pretty quick. The Organic Act, the, the, essentially the mission of the National Park Service, is to preserve and protect and conserve the scenery and the natural and historic objects, wildlife, unimpaired for the future, for, for, for the enjoyment of future generations. Okay, so when we're fishing in the ocean, we're not leaving things unimpaired. It's really that simple. In 1982, the Park Service implemented an inventory monitoring program. Channel Islands was one of five parks that were prototype parks. It's now a park that's widespread in the park service, completely underfunded. And its goals were to identify trends in ecosystem health, determine limits of variability, this is a natural change over time. Diagnose abnormal conditions, if we saw them, if we had a perspective well enough to do that, and suggestions to build treatments. It was originally not designed to answer questions, which makes this database so exciting because it's answered lots of questions in basic natural history. At the very least, we needed to start with this, documenting these shifting baselines. Okay, this is out of some of the Smithsonian stuff, which I actually got these slides from somebody else, probably Gary Davis, who started the program. And sure enough, at the Smithsonian this year, I saw the same photos. I'm like, oh, that's where those slides came from. So, 1950s in Florida. Okay, here's 1960, 2007, and 2013. Okay, and this is no joke. I mean, this is, this is the same dock, the same landings, and these people, these fishermen, are still happy with the catch they get. All right, the park and the monitoring. I'm giving this as background because I'm hoping it might support some interest in you to look at some of the data. There's tons of data to look at. I have endless ideas. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of my time. So 16 sites originally. In 2003, the new MPAs were established. We added 16 more sites to look at the Santa Barbara, the Anacapa, the Scorpion Anchorage. Um, Do you see that on your screen? Yeah. Okay, there's Scorpion Anchorage and then the Santa Rosa MPA. And we pair those sites up with as many of our existing sites to have some of the baseline data. Okay, so what we monitor, we now monitor over 120 different species, fish and birds, and algae in the water temperature. So I know there's other people here that are you know, not doing rain science, but I think wide, more widespread, there's a lot of rain science folks in here. So I'm not ridiculing really the other botanists or seabird biologists or whatever field you might have, but if you're working in the ocean, one of the problems that we have this management expects you to be doing everything. It's a problem. All right, I'm expected to know the vegetation, the algae, the invertebrates, the invertebrates, and then do the ocean temperature monitoring all at the same time. It is overwhelming, I can tell you that. But managers don't understand this. So when they ask you, why is your program so expensive? Well, I'm doing a whole ecosystem. I'm not just doing the plants. I'm not just doing the insects, which we're missing completely. All right, is Chris Lowe here? Good. <laughs> right. He thinks that white sharks are top of the food chain. They're not. It is sunflower stars. These are the top of the food chain. Well, actually, you see otters were, but we got rid of those in the 1800s. Right. You'll see COVID here. COVID was the first break in the data set. Um, we didn't go out for obvious reasons. We did five day trips. We live on a boat together, and that was just not permissible by the federal government. And you're going to see some trends here. I'm going to go through this pretty quick, and I'm hoping that this will be a little bit of a surprise to people. Um, Maybe not. And here's the blog. You heard about the West Coast wide disease effect that really affected sunflower stars and we think many of the other species, which it did, it did affect. 
And the interesting thing, the effect of those C stars at all of that is from what we know from our own studies. Okay. We've seen all these other declines, though, based on another wasting disease event that I call warm water. The blob, I don't think it's warm water. And the reason why I don't think it's warm water, even though it came up with warm water, it was at all depths. Those lower depths were still cold. Okay, with El Nino-driven wasting disease, the warm water, we only see those disease in the upper 60 feet of the water column where there's no warm water. Below that, there's a thermal line. And there's usually a reserve population of adults, and we see rebounds. You can see here there's been no rebound in population of some water stars. All right, let's go on to a different species. Bat stars. You can see a similar pattern here. Okay, but you can see during the blob, you didn't see that same drastic decline in 2013 when the blob showed up. What we did see is a greater decline in 2014-15 when the warm water showed up. And similar to all the other events. So even though it's in some of the citizen science data that bat stars were being affected, I think most of those are actually Mediaster up in the North Coast. And we didn't really observe that. All right, how about Chiasaster gigantius, the same thing we saw for sunflower star. Sure enough, these populations have recovered, where the bat stars you saw recovered quite rapidly because there was a lot of them around still. All right. So just perspective and things that you've heard, and I think this is an important story. And we see this not just from our long-term monitoring program, but the work that Paul Dayton um, and the integrity doing in San Diego, the San Angeles work, there's a few long-term monitoring programs that are showing the exact same patterns. This is just basic demographic data. Abalone, I'd like to sit here and spend the rest of the day talking about abalone, but I'm not going to do that. This is important for you to know. You can see the decline here. This is when the fishery was closed. It's obviously we closed or decreased our fishing pressure on this species, or these species, not just pink abalone, all abalone, way too late. Populations are recovering in Southern California. Things have been dramatically in the last 10 years, um, associated with the warm water event, probably recruitment of warm water coming from, from or bringing larvae up from down south, is what I hypothesize. Right. I'm showing you this because we serially deplete our resources in the ocean. And the next best resource, once you eat all the abalone, one of them is maybe turbine snails. And these are marketed, um, they're fished in Mexico. Um, a can of abalone from Mexico, well, 10 years ago, cost you $100. A can of maybe turbine snails would cost about 15 I don't know what the price is now today. So what if you're a student? What if you land this great NSF grant to figure out, okay, or uh, applied science, can we have a viable fishery for maybe turbine snails? And you start your study in 1982. And in the beginning, you have 0.5 per square meter, and at the end of their five years, you've got 1.5 per square meter. You go, wow, we can have fishery for this species, no problem. But what if you study it in the next five years? Your perspective will be totally different. And the next five years, somewhere, somewhere in between. And the next five years, wow, there's a lot of these around. Let's just go harvest them. And the next five years, there's nothing here worth the fishery. And the next five years, even less. And then, boom, you get that bob and the warm water, and that, we, have, we have things off the chart. So unlike sunflower, unlike the sea stars that don't do well during warm water, this is a warm water species in the Northern Channel Islands. We see these recruitment events during the warm water events, and then they die off or get eaten. Um, and you can see we're kind of off the charts right now. This is driven by these El Nino events for recruitment patterns that's opposite of what you saw with the disease um, or the pathogens we're seeing with sunflower stars. And in, in Zacharias from Cal State Channel Islands and myself wrote a paper on this um, based on just the wave height and temperature of the Santa Monica Bay Samui. And within 95% confidence of interval, we can predict the population at our sites. We almost don't need to study the animal anymore. Okay, that's great. We're doing fantastic. We might even have time. Um, orange puffball sponges. So if you could, you'd like to stand up for the board. If you could pretend that from 2005 on it doesn't exist. When I used to give talks, I used to tell people how much we thought that El Nino and La Nina were driving our ecosystems at the Channel Islands. And then in 2000, we had a 10 year period of cold water until we had a blob of warm water in 13, 14, 15. And I thought this species wasn't changing, and I was really frustrated to teach people. It was selected because it's a bright orange sponge. You can identify it. The other sponges are hard for people to identify. But I was really frustrated in teaching people to identify these because often they're covered with diatoms or silt, and they're this dark brown blob, and they're not bright orange. And people were missing them. And you train people and people pick it up. And I think overall our data is actually very good on this species, but it was something that took a lot of effort to train. I'm like, why are we doing this? Well, sure enough, you see this warm water event, you see we're off the charts, and then we, we see kind of a decline. And if you think about this in the system, I almost think this is like a canary in the gold mine. It doesn't have these abrupt changes, but tells us a lot about what's going on in our habitat. And when we see a lot of these, we tend to see have healthier, healthier kelp forests. They're not dominated by urchins, they're not dominated by, by little stars. Exactly what we saw yesterday. 
Right. Uh, species range extensions, I could talk about this a lot. This is one that the Intertidal Monitoring Program, Steve Whitaker, who I think is here, um, found. Um, we've seen similar types of things in the, in the intertidal zone. Um, I'm just talking about the subtitle. And then here's a pencil urchin that we saw in 2018 that's in the same crack this year, in 2022. And that's a range extension from, from County Island. And we see lots of these. We have lots of documentation of range extensions. So I like to sit here and talk about the stories of all the sites. Um, oh, those last set of slides you saw were the 16 original sites average. There's a lot of variation in there. Warm water versus cold water island, Santa Barbara versus San Miguel. But overall, those are the patterns that we're seeing. So over simple. Okay, so what about all the other work? Okay, not done by me, this is done by you. Many of, the, many of my colleagues, many of my mentors, many students have used these um, data for their thesis. And if you look at the publication types that have come out, there's been 64 peer, peer reviewed journal publications. Um, and then there's technical reports and whatnot, but there's many other um, reports that the Park Service has put out, annual reports. It's really good seeking material, but I described the sites and what we saw, and it's maybe really fun for me to read. But um, partners, authors, and cooperators, universities, international, MPS authors mixed in with the others, and, and they're on their own. So huge diversity. It's public data. Shared data. You can write the part for it, or you can assume this happened for it. And it um, program names. Sorry, I don't have the things on the bottom. But the left, the, the, the y-axis is the number of publications in any given year period. One to five on the, on the x-axis would be one to five years of program. Six to ten and so on. And then the parentheses is the number of publications. You can see that this data set really didn't become valuable until 20 years. So here I am mentoring other Park Service biologists that start a new long-term program, and they study something for five years, and they're like, we're not seeing much change. And park management asks them, well, what do you, can you tell us from the data? And they're like, well, there's a lot of variation. We can't tell you anything. Okay, well, this is part of the issue. I mean, this is part of the issue as a graduate student. Or, or a professor, it's about time. These animals have only lived to be 30 years old. Okay, urchins, 40, 50, 60 years old. Rockfish, how do we expect to go take a snapshot and make me understand the ecosystem? We don't, especially one that's manipulated. So the work we all do is extremely important, but it's important to keep it in perspective. And you can see over time how valuable these data sets become. And then here's the graph of knowledge, and it's kelp forest monitoring and ecosystem. So lots of health forest ecology papers, there's some overlap here, so you see more publications that we have. But anything to eDNA, to climate change, I mean, the, the data's been extremely, extremely valuable. All right, announcements. Um, thank you all, first and foremost. And this is my time to be able to give this, this group of people some, some announcements I wasn't really planning to do. One is, um, I'm announcing my retirement. I'm retiring December 31st. Thank you. Now I'm retiring from the Park Service. I'm not retiring as a naturalist. I kind of hope I'll get to my list of ideas from the data, and I have plenty of them. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, in WSN for Naturalists a year, I'm sure there'll be a little write-up. I'll post my new email address. For those of you who have David Kushner at mps.gov, it's gonna be gone. Um, we don't get lifelong addresses, like if you're at the university, it's gonna be a problem. So I've created a new one, that's gonna be David Kushner KFMP for Kelp Force Mining Program at Gmail. And then a lot of you have my personal kelp crab email. I don't care which one you use, but I decided I need something other than kelp crab from my non-professional <laughs> name in it. So um, feel free to reach out. I, I'm not retired from this group. I, I'll hopefully become more active, actually. And I have plenty of ideas. Um, new lead for Kelp Force Mining. This is not official yet, but I talked to Scott, and he decided to announce here. So Scotty Gamara, um, who I think many of you know, <laughs> That's very refreshing. So I'm very impressed with Scotty. I've only met him once. Um, and I'm not gonna have very much overlap with, with him, and um, it's a bummer for no reasons, but we'll try to do this what we can. Scotty is an amazing person. He'll be able to figure it out. It'll be a good test of the modern program if you can carry the torch. Um, it's tough times for the park service, it's not easy. But Scotty has his personality, I'm extreme confidence, and I think he's gonna do wonderful. Um, perhaps be a lot less frustrated than I am. Um, Biological technicians, we use biological technicians positions for the Health Force Monitoring Program. Um, and the hiring is going to start this year a little bit early, December 12th to 17th. So if you're a diver with a ton of experience, um, you should be looking for this in usajobs.gov. It's only open for seven, day, seven days as HR does not want to see 500 applications and sort through them. It takes them too much time. So um, 
Ask somebody who successfully applied to a government job before you apply. If you just do it on your own, you may not succeed, okay? Get advice, talk about it over the phone. I can't do things in the way, okay? There's gonna be a GS6 permanent position. We rarely have permanent positions opening. This is gonna open probably around the first of the year. It's a low level, I apologize for that. I've been arguing for higher level positions, but this is what it is. And that's gonna be on Kill Force Mining and Rocket River Title. So if any of you have Rocket River Title and Kill Force experience, you should apply. And then there's gonna be a GS579 ladder position that's gonna be very similar. Um, and that position is actually replacing my GS12 position. Um, sad as it is, that's the reality of the budgets of the Park Service. That could change if we get a new budget from Congress. So anyways, um, USA Jobs, talk to people, call me up. Um, you can get my, there's a lot of people that shouldn't have my personal contact. If for some reason you get David Fisher and Vino suck up and you get a reject, I don't no longer exist there, find my name through somebody else. Okay, so a huge thanks to you and the community and thank you so much for the award and the recognition. Um, I can't tell you how much it means at the end of my career. It means a tremendous amount. So, thank you.